Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Beatriz. How are you doing? Hi. Thank you, Sarah. I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining me for this interview for your agenda. Uh, just a brief introduction. Beatriz is a professor at King's College London, and she also runs her own lab at the Centre for Developmental Neurobiology. And she's here with me to discuss a bit about her role, her career, and some opinions about women in science. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining me. I really, really appreciate uh, your, uh, giving uh, your time to joining us and this project. And so I would just start immediately by asking you to talk about a bit about your career, the role that you cover uh, at the center and how you reached your position. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, it's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, somehow transmit uh, my passion about science and uh, to encourage other people, um, particularly women, uh, to follow up this, this career or to stay in this career. It's our so, pleasure. Um, so I, I would say that, I mean, the, so my passion from, for science started very early, but that means that for everybody is the same. And I, my steps to go towards where I am now. So it was uh, driven fully by motivation. So this is important because I would say that everybody that is motivated, uh, you need to believe in yourself. doesn't matter if it's a man or, or a woman. And, and you need to pursue your dreams. Um, and this is what drove me along all my career. So I did my undergraduate studies in biology in Madrid. And then I did my PhD in Madrid as well. And then from that, I moved to do my post, uh, did my postdoc in the San Francisco in UCSF. I, I spent a beautiful and wonderful time there, five years and enjoy very much. Uh, I mean, all the steps in my career has been very revealing. And uh, from there, uh, I learned many things. And particularly, I learned how to be independent somehow and also I learned that I really want to pursue not only my career in science that I was it was very clear for me but I wanted to really pursue um, a, an independent career in a way that I could be uh, a, the principal investigator of the uh, ideas that I could generate or uh, together with also my team and progress my career as independent researchers having my own lab. So from UCSF, I got a tenure track position uh, back uh, in Spain. Uh, this was two years uh, till I had my, I mean, this tenure track positions for people that is Spanish, they might know, it's Ramon y Cajal. Mm -hmm. uh, then I again uh, I got my uh, tenure position. I, I, I went through the, um, the SIG route, which is only research. Uh, it's a research institution in Spain. Uh, and and then I was uh, with this position around eight years. So in total, uh, uh, I mean, I started my lab around 20, uh, 2005. So this was the, my period in Spain. Uh, during this time, I grew up as a junior investigator, I, having my own lab, having first my very small group and growing up and I was uh, very lucky to uh, be granted with the European Research Council grant uh, consolidator that uh, somehow pushed me to the next stage of my career. Which, uh, so, of course, I, I was more competitive. I was able to do, uh, like, perhaps more risky science. And uh, thanks to all people that ha I have been having in my lab, all different states, uh, from my first PhD students, uh, to my first postdocs going, growing uh, towards, of course, my technicians, lab managers uh, in the different states of my career. So from there in 20, in uh, 2014, I, uh, I moved to, uh, I, to King's College London. I was recruited there as professor. And uh, so I, I was lucky to uh, convince uh, the majority of my lab, and this is, was this was a difficult thing for them because they had many people had to move uh, their families uh, from Alicante, where I was in the Institute of Neuroscience, to uh, King's College London, and uh, but 
many people move and this uh, made that the transition was better for me. Unfortunately, there are other people that I uh, still miss them because they had to, uh, for uh, family reasons, they had to stay in Alicante, but still uh, we are in close contact. So from there, I have been from uh, 2014 till now, uh, as I have been a professor here. And uh, so my role here is, uh, so I, I do teaching, what I, I didn't do before. This is another uh, like a area of that I am, I, I was new when I when I came. I, I really like very much to do teaching, although I had to say that I love more to do research, but I, I learn a lot from my undergraduate students, also from my master's students. And it's very revealing to uh, somehow uh, for junior people to uh, somehow transmit also this passion about science and uh, hopefully to encourage them to follow up uh, this career. Uh, I am also a uh, part of the uh, Steering uh, Scientific Committee in the center, uh, which uh, somehow uh, is trying to, to get, I mean, to discuss and get advice to the head of the department, Oscar Marin, on, on perhaps uh, different strategies to implement and increase the, our uh, profile in, in, research, in the research part in the center. And of course, I participate as everybody else in, in all meetings and uh, discussions that we have in our, in our center here at uh, uh, King's College London. Yeah, and yeah, and you run a really successful and big lab <laughs> as well. Okay, thank you. I mean, <laughs> I mean, now we are getting even yeah bigger. So and yeah, yeah, it's sometimes it's challenge, but uh, but uh, yeah, I am very happy with. The people that I have, and uh, and it's super fun to to do this at this level. So yeah. Uh, move on with the next question. Um, so I would like to know now uh, what is uh, what do you like most uh, about your job? So maybe both uh, as a professor and as a principal investigator. Okay. So what I like more about uh, being a researcher, principal investigator, is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the saying that I, I used to love as a scientist, uh, mm -hmm. which is the discovery. I mean, for me, and I still think, uh, hopefully this will stay forever <laughs> till I retire, is the sparkling thing, is that uh, this kind of uh, happiness that comes to you, uh, of course, I am not in the microscope doing experiments anymore. My people is doing that and they are doing much better than I used to do. And, uh, but just when they present me their work and we discuss together, or I am thinking about their projects and I read this paper or I start to make these links. So they, this happiness that say, oh, oh, this is very important. Oh, this is very interesting. I, I really still, uh, and hopefully stay forever, uh, have this passion about discovery. And I think that this is the main thing, uh, at least for me, but I think that is quite extensive for another scientist of the highlight of science is that the continuous discovery and creativity when you just really have true. the right idea. Really, really true. And, and uh, the, from, for, as a teacher, I, I like to, so to me, the, I mean, when I see that, so I like more research as I said before, but when it's, one thing that I love of teaching is that when I see that they understand the point and they ask all these questions, uh, that this means that I bridge them. And to me, it's very important because uh, I mean, even they don't like, they don't want to stay in science. I think that uh, the issue that uh, they understand the concepts, they understand the question, they understand the big picture of what I am saying. I think that to me is very refreshing and is, is something I say, okay, I, I, I think that I did this okay. I did this well because I, I, I was able to transmit this information uh, and they re it reached to them, to these young people. I think it's very like um, rewarding to when you manage to simulate a really interesting discussions and yeah, and you manage to inspire people to read more and get more curious about your subject and like, yeah. Yeah, if I may say something, so I mean, one of the things, I mean, this might be like, uh, I am making this up, but it's not real. So when I see any of my PhD students or any of my postdocs giving a talk, 
and answering the giving a spectacular talk and answering the questions. I am so proud and happy happy about them in a way that okay they they reach this and they uh, so they are even better explaining this than me. I, I think that this is I, I think that it happens to many of the scientists, but because this is a transmission of, of the next generations, and this is I think that this is the best of also being a scientist to be able to transmit this information and to be able to to encourage people at different stages of, of their career. To do. Uh, and one more question. So uh, I would like to know now, what do you find the most challenging about your job? Like mainly as a researcher, okay. I would say. Okay. Uh, so, so about as a researcher, which is this is general for men and, and women, uh, I think that the most uh, challenging part for most of us, because some people has uh, some scientists uh, have uh, core funding, is the grant applications. And this is, I'm not saying that this is something bad, because also makes us to think. But the issue that there is uh, not so much funding in some areas uh, and it's so competitive. I mean, it's good because it generates in us ideas, but it's so to be in a constant uh, uh, stress of uh, having enough money, not for me, I have my own salary, but I am not only a teacher, I am a researcher, but every, I mean, I, I have to say I have been uh, quite lucky because uh, most of my grants are five years grant. So at least it gives you the, um, somehow the peace of, of being, uh, not being so stressed as if it's the three years grant. But I can think of all these uh, young researchers that they are applying for um, a, a three year projects. I mean, here in UK, you can think of this uh, MRC, uh, grants or uh, BBSRC grants for our areas. Uh, and I mean, every so before you finish the project, before you have anything, because in science, uh, when you do science at a certain level in a way that uh, you are doing solid science, it's not something that you do in one year. So basic science takes longer. And I would say that basic science is the core of biomedicine and the core of, of translation because mm -hmm. most of the findings are coming. Uh, to uh, translation uh, from basic science. Uh, so I think I can see that, and because I see this in myself anytime that one of my grants is going to run next year. Uh, so the, the constant stress to, to be able to finish project and to maintain people that needs to finish this project. Uh, so that is instead, what do you think is the most challenging part of being a woman in a scientific environment? like in, in academia? Yeah. Okay, so in academia, uh, so I think that, I think that is probably something that is general for any jobs for women is that uh, the most challenge is the conciliation of, with the family. So you, and I, again, I, I have to say this, I respect uh, women that they don't want to have family. But if you want to have family, you want to have kids. I think that the most challenge situation that we face is uh, uh, the support of course, the support of institutions in a way that, it, I mean, sometimes it's very expensive to have a, a childcare. Uh, and I think that uh, maybe the institutions may need to, to have, to make an effort to uh, somehow uh, subsidize this uh, for, for women, at least in part, not for women. Uh, this is the wrong word, for the family. And this links to my second point about this, uh, which is that it's important, it's critical for women to have a supported uh, partner because uh, the family job is a, is a partner share job. And this means that uh, it's critical for the women to believe that, that sometimes we don't believe that, and for the men or any partner to, to support uh, the women uh, that wants to uh, follow up their careers. And of course, now that we are talking about science, specifically for the career in science, and share responsibilities in, in the house, including uh, for the kids. Uh, and the second challenge that I think for women is that this is more complex, uh, because I think that we will fight that. I think that new generations are more aware of that. 
uh, men, uh, new, uh, I mean, the, the new people that is coming, they have been grow up in different cultures. And I think that this is, this is become to be different. But the second part is more, is still there. I mean, after so many years, this is what I call unconscious bias. It's a continuous uh, a delivery of the way that we speak, the way that we refer. Uh, this is general for other jobs, but it's particularly uh, strong in science. And I think that what means an unconscious bias? I don't say, uh, so I have many uh, friends that they have this unconscious bias and they are not, uh, sexist people. So they are not people that is, they are thinking that the women are less, but it's our culture. Myself, sometimes I have unconscious bias. It's our culture, the way that we talk. And I think that this, this is a very important uh, issue. And I, I, I like to grow up this, uh, there was this BBC interview for uh, a professor. Uh, uh, she, I think that she was a sergeant. It was two sergeants, two professors from, uh, I don't remember, it was UCL. Uh, and, and in this BBC interview, uh, the title of uh, this interview, she was not professor, she was not a, a, a sergeant, and uh, however, uh, his, uh, her colleague, she, uh, he was very well named as uh, a professor and a, a sergeant, and she was only the name. As, as it was. And this is something that, I mean, see, of course, he tweeted this information and uh, everybody was kind of mad into it. And of course, there was men saying that this is, not, uh, why are you saying this? Ah, uh, this is the minor thing. No, it's not a minor thing. This is the our yes, daily life. And the only way uh, that we have to fight this is to say it because most of the time we don't realize of this unconscious bias. I don't realize myself about this unconscious bias. Sometimes I have this. So the only way is to say, okay, look, this is unconscious bias, and then we will learn from the experience. And I think that this is so simple. And I hope that everybody understands at some point in the future. As you said, we discussed about the difficulties of like women in the academia. And um, my last question is like, what positive actions uh, could be taken to increase the female representation uh, at uh, senior levels in the academia? Okay, so I think that there are several positive actions. I, I think that I mentioned a couple of them before. Well, the first one is that I think that maybe the institutions needs to make an effort to help uh, the families to uh, uh, somehow have this uh, support for raising children in the uh, some uh, percentage of payment for the childcare uh, and the cost of, of things like that. This is one thing. The second thing is that, uh, so women, we need to believe in our dreams. So we need to believe that we want to pursue that and uh, trying to somehow uh, let our partners know about our dreams and ask for the equality. The third thing, I think that this, as I said, is something that uh, we need to move from time. Uh, it's not going to be immediately, uh, but I think that it's important to, uh, to speak up about unconscious bias uh, every time that we say, I mean, we see. So of course, if I do myself, I say, I'm sorry, this is unconscious bias. What I mean is this, if I see someone to do it, in a very polite way, say, okay, uh, this is unconscious bias. And this is important because what I have seen uh, in many, um, because uh, so part of, of this unconscious bias cultural thing is going to uh, some of the panels where you are sit there and these are panels that are uh, uh, reviewing, uh, not of course, not only grant applications, but in interviewing panels for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, big grants or uh, junior grants or uh, recruitments. So you can see the difference between how uh, females and males are, I mean, they speak. So we are very different and as, this is totally fine. But because this is unconscious bias, the way that we uh, express ourselves is very different. So you really need to point out, okay, uh, this is, so you are saying if this woman doesn't uh, respond in the same aggressive way, or a perhaps a strongly confident way to your questions. So you are 
questioning the quality of this woman. And this is totally wrong. So, so we need to, even we are fewer in these panels, we need to speak up, we need to, we need to be very strong uh, and evaluate pure science, pure quality, and not if the candidate is more aggressive, the candidate is uh, speaking with a, a very strong confidence, even the candidates know what to, to say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this is very important. Um, and as the fewer of us that are in those panels uh, reach these problems when the problems are there. So sometimes there is, I mean, the, the problem is not there, but I have been in panels where the, this was a problem. So I, I think that this is, this is quite critical. Thanks a lot, Beatrice, for joining me. It was a really interesting chat. And thanks a lot uh, to all of You're you welcome. for listening to us. And bye, bye, bye. It has been. Thank you very much, Sarah. Bye-bye.